Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our RimWorld adventure in the Cold Bog with the Cult of Jinx. Last time we left off after somewhat unexpectedly taking a big step towards the end of the series, because by gifting them a bunch of stuff we have now allied ourselves with the faction holding the first part of the Arconexus map, and we also completed another quest that got us one step closer to obtaining the Redhawk Relic, a powerful plasma sword. Today we start things off still in winter, but a small group of muffalo has wandered in, offering a great opportunity for our combat specialist's maniac took Chutney and Donut to gain some target practice, not to mention that this should also secure our food supply for the next few days. Amidst the chaos, we also witnessed the birth of another grizzly bear, and as always, chosen from the list of patron supporters in the naming rights to end above, this one will now be named Guwiwa. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Either way, welcome to Liviana. The rest of the day then remains rather uneventful. The majority of our colony is busy either with meditating food production or with the manufacturing of more stone blocks. Keep in mind that we still want to construct that monument as part of a quest we received a few days ago. And not only do we need some space to do that, but also plenty of materials. In the evening then, it is once again time to renew the psychic love between Took and Squigs. No, I have not yet given up on the two of them. Maybe this here will finally nudge them in the right direction. On the following morning then, you can see we have put up a campfire inside of our tree temple, because it is time for the admittedly somewhat delayed celebrations of last episode's completed quest, a quest that did actually cost both of our Psycasters a good amount of psychic focus, so with a big bang drum ritual here we are now hoping to recharge that. And with the entire Cult of Jinx banging away, we then also achieve that. All of our Psycasters have been fully topped up and we also received another ideology development point, although I'd say it's questionable whether or not we actually need those anymore. By the way, the sensory mechanites disease is of course also still going strong, but as long as we have enough medicine to treat everyone, it shouldn't become a huge problem. The only thing that's a bit annoying is the increased need for sleep, but I think we can live with that, especially since less than half of our colonists are actually affected. In the evening then, our trusty anima tree is once again ready for its next linking ritual, and I think our next target to power up to level 6 is going to be Wyatt, but at the moment temperatures are just a bit too cold to keep him out here for 3 more hours, so I think we'll take care of that tomorrow. On that following morning then, we also receive another quest that we can actually quickly decline. No, we are not going to spare 10 of our colonists for 21 days, especially if all we get out of it is some goodwill, a nose job or a lousy TV. And by the way, thanks to your feedback on the last episode, we are now also getting rid of this quest here. No, accepting a 16 day long volcanic winter does not exactly strike me as the smart choice to make at the moment. Not only would we put our entire Devil's Strand harvest at risk, but the rewards here are actually worse than in the previous quest. And we do still have something to work towards with the space drone hack here, which we will very likely get to in just a few moments. For the time being though, we can watch as Maniac and Rodini are working our small granite mine. Maniac has actually improved his mining skill to level 11 doing this, and as you can see we have cleared a good section of rock already, producing a few extra hundred units of granite stone blocks. Now we'll need quite a bit more than that, but we're also not done yet. For now though, our attention is taken by Armando, who has received another inspiration, and with this one being a creativity inspiration, we might want to be very careful with the item he finishes next. For example, using this on the wolfskin ravager armor he's currently making seems like a bit of a waste to me. Ideally, we are using it on something made out of thrombofur or devil strand, or perhaps on a uranium or plasteel helmet. In the afternoon then, an eclipse sets in, but that does not stop us from starting the next tree linking ritual. Maniac and Squeaks will not participate, they have other stuff to do, but we should still have enough people here to regrow a good amount of anima grass, as Wyatt works towards Psycaster level 2. And I think I have mentioned this before, but I think the Psycasts at rank 2 are by far the most boring in the game, so it actually wasn't easy to make a selection here. Ultimately, we end up going with Word of Joy. This could be interesting as a last resort to prevent mental breaks, although it does also reduce consciousness, so it has to be used selectively. In the evening then, our first slightly dangerous situation of the episode arises, as a cougar is striking back against Donut and might actually catch her, at least if she were to open the door here in a normal way. 
Luckily though, we have Psycaster Freya standing by, who can quickly teleport Donut into safety, and following that, our Huntress then quickly finishes off the animal. On the next morning then, as you can see, we are still eclipsed, but I think it is time that we now start working on that space drone hack, and we're going to do so with our animal handler Squeaks here, who despite her intellectual skill of only 3, actually has the highest hacking speed of all people in Liviana, and that is the result of a 35% work speed increase from her industrious trait. Now, the process here is simple, we have seen it before, as soon as we accept the quest, a space drone will land, and we need to hack it. As long as we do, enemies will keep attacking us every 8 hours, so that is why we want to hack it as quickly as we can to reduce the number of enemy waves actually coming at us. Luckily then, the space drone lands right inside our village, which makes this a bit easier, but also a bit more unpredictable in terms of where our enemies will end up attacking from. And since every second counts, Kevin here already gets started while Squix runs over to the drone. And since hacking speed is actually reduced in darkness, we also want to drop a solar pinhole next to her. That way we do get the full 120%. And with the clock ticking down, our melee guys then already get into their combat suits. And while they do, we are then informed of something that might actually end up working in our favor, as it looks like most of the rats on the map have just been driven insane by a psychic wave. You can see it in the animal tab here, we are looking at about 25 maddened animals, certainly not the most powerful ones, but maybe enough to delay our attackers for just a few extra seconds. Or perhaps they find some easier targets first, as we are now also visited by a small group of tribal traders. Unfortunately, it looks like these three are going to find their end here some way or another, either killed by the rats or by the pirates arriving in just a few hours. Until that happens though, we have another name to give out though, to yet another grizzly bear. This one will now be named Wojo, after the patron supporter of the same name. Squeaks, meanwhile, is briefly replaced by Chutney, so that she can receive treatment for her mechanites. Chutney, meanwhile, can boast with a hacking speed of 109%, caused by the fact that he possesses both the hard worker and neurotic traits. However, with the Eclipse at an end and with Squeaks fully treated, the two of them can change places again. And with only one hour left on the clock until the raiders arrive, our people are now assembling. Again, I'm not entirely sure where our attackers will come from, but I'm sure we'll find that out soon enough. Alright, and here they are, the pirates have arrived, 25 of them to be exact. This time we are looking at proper weaponry, ranging from swords to assault rifles, and it also looks like they're going to meet their first bit of resistance rather quickly, as our three rat fighting traps people here are right in their path. And so, unfortunately, it only takes a few seconds for the traders to be shot down. The pirates, meanwhile, are heading for the most direct route towards the space drone, while all of our cultists, except for Squeaks, of course, are rushing for the gates to meet them. And while we could probably cheese this with some combination of psychic powers, I am actually curious to see how well our colonists fare against a group of raiders with modern weaponry. So we are taking them on in a more straightforward fashion here, with a trio of melee blockers in the front and everyone else huddled behind them. And of course, also with light here not set to automatically fire, I gave him the doomsday rocket launcher just in case. And so far, I have to say, things are going quite well, we are of course using Berserk Pulse liberally. However, considering the number of injuries we have sustained, I think it's time to retreat a bit. Our army of bears can draw some fire while we do that, after all, we have plenty of them to spare. Sadly though, that approach then also leads to the unfortunate death of Grizzly Bear Vladamia, and even though we managed to defeat our enemies for good a few moments later, this does still hurt a bit, especially considering that she was one of our longest tenured animals. Still, for now, Squeaks and the Space Drone are safe and none of our colonists actually died, and that was admittedly the main objective. We do have a few other bears that need immediate first aid though, so we are now having a few of our colonists take care of that, and a little later in the evening then, Leafheart Kevin can also finally treat our human patients. And despite things looking dicey for a few seconds, we suffer no further losses on the grizzly bear front, and just a few moments later, Squeaks then also finishes the space drone hack, just in time to avoid a second group of enemies, although, as we already saw in an earlier episode, they would have left if we had finished the hack during their attack. 
Either way, the space drone now explodes and we are one step closer to obtaining the plasma sword Redhawk. Although, as you can see, at the small cost of our bridge here, which we will likely need to get fixed soon. On the following morning then, only Chutney, Thoraya and Wyatt remain on the injured list. As Armando begins the manufacturing of a Uranium Guardian helmet, it looks like we have obtained the necessary materials in the raid. And unless something better comes along, I think this is a good use of his inspiration. The day itself then remains rather uneventful, as you can see our granite mine is coming along nicely. We will of course need some of that granite to rebuild our walls, but luckily our enemies did not destroy too much. Around midnight then we can watch as Animal Handler Squigs buries Grizzly Bear Vladamia, and we can take comfort in the fact that we have plenty more bears ready to go, although this one will of course be sorely missed. Our mood is then further brightened by Armando finishing a legendary uranium helmet. That was what I had hoped for, and with stats that are actually slightly better than those of a marine helmet, I think we have produced ourselves a lovely piece of gear here. We'll have to see who eventually gets to wear it. By the way, Armando himself already sits comfortably at crafting level 20, and considering that he won't ever have to sleep again, I think it's safe to say that he will remain there for the foreseeable future. And so, a new day in the Cold Bog begins as we actually salvage some of the marine armor and helmets that our enemies brought with them. Obviously, not all of it is in great condition, but still, most of it is better than what we have. Our colonists and their gear are then unfortunately also put to the test again quite quickly, as in the middle of the night we are attacked yet again, and I think we have finally reached the point where Randy throws some proper pirate raids at us, although it is probably questionable whether or not that's actually better or worse. Either way, with 60 pirates and their heavy weaponry coming at us, let's take a different approach this time around. As you can see, to get us started here, we are only sending out our two main sidecasters, Freya and Light. Admittedly though, this approach is only made possible by the fact that our enemies have decided to wait a while before attacking. Nonetheless, here's what we're going to do. With Light approaching from the north, we are now going to skip him in close and then drop a Berserk Pulse from this direction, which unfortunately also results in him getting shot before I was able to skip him back out again. I think this is actually the first time this happened and he did go down, but that is mostly due to the massive consciousness penalty that he's already running around with by default. Still, of course, we don't want to drag this out for too long, but I am fairly optimistic that we will be able to rescue him. And that now brings us to Freya, who is patiently looping around the other side of the rock here. Our enemies, meanwhile, are using up a lot of their good stuff early, and are now in fact also beginning their assault properly. High time for us to delay them just a little while longer with another Berserk Pulse, this one actually centered on the guy with the triple rocket launcher, so that maybe we are able to scavenge it after the fight. And so, while our enemies continue to bash their own heads in, Freya calmly escapes. Eventually, what remains to actually make an attack is about half of the enemy forces. And well, as you can see, a familiar setup is already waiting for them. Now, I somewhat expect the rest of this fight to be short and quick, but still, let's make it a little bit easier just because we can. Casting a Berserk Pulse on the guy holding the shield pack here will likely force them to drop that, and that means it won't be in the way of any of our shooters. From this point onwards then we can watch the carnage unfold, although admittedly it is not much of a carnage to begin with. The enemy's early birds are definitely getting their fair share of blasts to the face here, and it only takes us a handful of kills until the rest decide to flee. So looks like the Cult of Jinx is finally capable of dealing with proper pirate raids, so that is good to see. It likely also means though that we are going to see more of them, which might not be as much cause for celebration. Still, it also perhaps offers a good explanation as to why the Cult of Jinx is becoming more and more modern in their ways. We have absolutely not given up on our tribal tree-loving roots just yet, but modern weaponry and the occasional stint in power armor are becoming more and more frequent, which definitely helps foster that feeling that we are coming up on the end of a chapter here. For the time being though, let us perhaps first take care of our Psycaster Light, because despite the fact that he did not actually suffer any super life-threatening injuries, the blood loss has reduced his consciousness to a point where he is in fact close to dying, so let us put a stop to that before it gets worse. 
Thoraya then strips our enemies, we once again have a good amount of marine gear among them. Most of that is of course tainted gear and comes with the corresponding mood penalty. But then again, we do have a handful of colonists who don't actually care about that. Not to mention that in fights like the one we just fought, there are likely more pressing matters to focus on. For the rest of the afternoon then, we spend our time with cleanup and wealth management. Chutney can use an incendiary launcher we picked up some time ago to burn some of the enemy corpses in the gear, as all of that actually counts towards our colony wealth and we have no intention of using it anytime soon. This endeavor is certainly helped by the fact that the cold of winter has killed off most of the plants in the area, so the fire is unlikely to spread beyond the area where we want it to be. Also, it is currently not snowing, which as far as I know has a similar effect on fires as rain. Finally then, we are informed that the anima tree is ready for yet another linking ritual, but considering that temperatures are still freezing cold and that Wyatt is currently sleeping, I would say let's take care of that in the next episode. For today, as you can see, we have officially transitioned over into spring, so the worst of winter is most likely behind us, but who knows what Randy still has in store for us. In the next episode then, I think we will finally start working on that huge monument quest, perhaps we also get lucky and can finally complete the hunt for the Redhawk relic, and at that point, all that is left to do would be to increase our colony wealth past 200,000, and then we can put an end to the series, or at least to its first chapter. So, until then, I hope you enjoyed today's video, and if you did, then I would of course be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.peatcomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.